usually, um, I, do, I well, always I do research for these, and I usually have to go to a lot of different places. Uh, often it's uh, scholarly databases and such through a library. But for this last one, I found this website, and you know, when you find a website, it's like okay, well, you know, it's going to be hit or miss. This was hit. So I just wanted to tell you that a lot of the material tonight comes from this excellent website called The Pursuit of Happiness. Uh, and uh, they do a great job. Uh, it's a group of psychologists who wanted to learn more about the science of happiness. And I saw that and I thought, oh, it's going to be one of those psychological study places, which is great. And there are a lot of those. Uh, Dan Gilbert, for example. But I go to the history of happiness, and it's great stuff um, that some of which you'll hear about tonight. So the talk tonight is not the art of happiness, because I wanted to point us above something that we might consider happiness, which is generally fleeting. Uh, I think we think of it. So I always like to use the word well-being. Uh, to indicate something permanent, more permanent. So let's just go over a few of the words which I think are interesting. So the word happy uh, etymologically means lucky. Lucky, right? So isn't that interesting? Um, turning out well from hap, chance or fortune. <laughs> um, yeah, some other meanings. Pleasure. Uh, the Greek hedon, which we're going to come back to later on. Um, delight, enjoyment, again, nice, but not so permanent, right? This, uh, a very nice feeling, uh, sweet. Um, some of the cognates are sweet and um, delight, enjoyment, sure. Bliss, uh, Old English, which means, which is related to Blythe, which I didn't know, uh, but it's kind of interesting. So. So Blythe means like, you know, kind of just above it all and not caring. Uh, but from that we get bliss, which of course, merriment, happiness, grace, favor. The, the word I used in the title, well-being, is a rough translation of Aristotle's Greek word, eudaimonia. So um, again, roughly well-being, you may recognize parts of that word if probably know enough English cognates to know that the EU prefix means something good. And the daimon is, is, is not a demon. It's just a, a spirit uh, that's usually with you. Socrates had a daimon, just this kind of, I don't know, not an angel, just kind of a, a spirit that's above you, uh, but informs you and is talking to you. We might call it consciousness, or not consciousness, conscience. Uh, but, it, but again, like in the West, especially now, we tend to ionize everything into good and bad. The, the daimon is not good or bad. It's just kind of this voice from something larger than you. So eudaimonia is well-being. All right, let's look into what some people have said about happiness or well-being. I think you know the Buddha. I deliberately chose the particular Buddha that's laughing. Um, and smiling. Isn't that great? That's a sculpture in China. Um, so uh, the Four Noble Truths, just so we know. Uh, life is suffering. Suffering is caused by desire. Desire can be broken. Desire can be broken by following the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. All right, so here, right here from the Buddha, we're going to see these themes continuing on in, our, in the history of our understanding of happiness. And what this produces, ultimately, uh, suffering, the word for suffering there is tanha, which means to burn. And what you want as a result of the Eightfold Path is actually nirvana, which means to extinguish. So there's no positive sense of happiness. It's simply the cessation of the burning, which is, in itself, can be happy. In fact, if you can practice the Eightfold Path, 
uh, in your life here and now, then you reach what the Buddhists call equanimity, which is a kind of balance. Another notion that's going to reappear in our discussion of happiness. Our old friend Socrates, of course, um, Interesting, uh, as always. So there's a dialogue that's not very well known, uh, Euthymidus. Uh, 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 it's really about, well, it's not really about happiness, but he has this um, passage on happiness. Uh, he says, um, Euthymidus says, <clears throat> excuse me, so what follows from what we said? Isn't it this, that of the other things, none is either good or bad, and that of these two, wisdom is good and ignorance is bad. And Socrates says this. Well, then let's have a look at what's left. Since all of us desire to be happy, and since we evidently become so on account of our use, that is our good use of other things, right, the appropriate use of things, and since knowledge is what provides this goodness of use and also good fortune, every person must, as seems plausible, Prepare himself every means for this to be as wise as possible. Not too surprising for Socrates, but still a point to be made and one that's going to be repeated tonight over and over, that to be happy is to be wise. No, that's not right. To be wise is to enable yourself to be happy. Let's put it that way. Yes. And then uh, the symposium that we met, that we met, that we talked about in the... Uh, Discussion on love. Um, if ever, if man's ev is life is ever worth the living, it is when he has attained the vision of the soul of beauty. I think you know Plato and Socrates by now. We're always going to be moving up, 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 away from the material and into the immaterial. And once you have seen it, you will never be seduced again by the charm of gold, of dress, of comely boys. You will care nothing for the beauties that used to take your breath away. And when one discerns this beauty, one will perceive the true virtue, not virtue, semblance. And when a man has brought forth and reared this perfect virtue, he shall be called the friend of God. And if ever it is capable of man to enjoy, enjoy immortality, it shall then be given to him. I think this is right in the sense that I don't believe in the forms and all that that Plato talked about. But I believe in the sense that you must keep ascending. You must keep ascending. I think unhappiness, in my experience and in my readings, comes, unhappiness comes when you stop. When you stop. When you're like, okay, I'm here. I'm done. I don't need to know anything more. I don't need to do anything more. I don't need to feel anything more. I think that's a recipe for unhappiness, and I think uh, Socrates got that right. You know, the Republic, I think, Plato's ideal society, which is not a democracy, by the way. Maybe you can appreciate that now in ways that you didn't before. It's a timocracy. You have the, the ruler is a philosopher king. Uh, so it's a ruling based on honor or timeo. He says this, the pleasures that result from pursuing virtue, I'm sorry, this is from the website, the pleasures that result from pursuing virtue and knowledge are of a higher quality than the pleasures resulting from mere animal desires. Again, you know this, I think, by now for Plato and Socrates, is you must transcend the immediate and go to the permanent. Our old friend Aristotle is here, Plato's student, and uh, he actually has a lot to say about happiness, and you may know some of this. Uh, this comes from uh, his classic work on ethics, the Nicomachean Ethics, named after his son. Um, and he says this, the purpose of life is that which is desirable in itself and never for the sake of something else. Let me say that again. That which is desirable in itself and never for the sake of something else. Think about that. That's a good rule to live by, that is desirable in itself, not for the sake of something else. Aristotle's technical term for this is, an in, it's, he calls it entelechy. And the word there in the middle is telos, the end or goal. So it's the goal is in itself. You know where we get this debate more than anywhere else? 
and I had it this week, I had a conversation this week about it, is in education. Are you getting an education to get a job, to get more money, to get credentialed? Are you getting an education for the sake of an education? Um, you know where I had this conversation was with two of our recent graduates. And uh, they just got their master's degree and they said, well, what about the PhD? Are you going to do the PhD? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. There's too many PhDs in the world. There's no jobs for PhDs. And they're like, what's that got to do with it? I'm like, all right. I'm like, why do you want a PhD? Because we want to learn. I'm like, okay, that's the winning argument right there. So I'll get a PhD program up tomorrow. Um, that's it. There, there's also a great book you may not know uh, called The Idea of a University by uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman, that uh, late 19th century, uh, that argues for learning as learning's sake. It's the argument for the liberal arts, the idea of the university. Uh, Aristotle, as always, is practical. He's practical to Plato's abstractions and uh, perhaps impracticalities. The function of a person, I'm going to help these guys with their pronouns, if you don't mind. The function of a person is to live a certain kind of life. And this activity implies a rational principle. There it is again. To, happiness is involved with rationality, with thinking. And the function of a good man, person, <laughs> and the good and noble performance of these, and if any action is well performed, it is performed in accord in, in a, Sorry, in accord with the appropriate excellence. It is performed in accord with the appropriate excellence. That is another Greek word. I don't know if you'll know. It's called a rete, A-R-E-T-E. And it means more than what we would call excellence. It means some, it's hard to translate. It's some sort of surpassing, almost transcendent quality of goodness. But also, not just, it's like this combination of goodness and excellence. Excellence at what you do, goodness in the doing of it. There you go. There's a good translation. I should remember that. Um, all right. This is interesting and a little troubling. Aristotle says, you cannot be happy until your life is over. <laughs> Again, he's practical to a fault sometimes because he says, how are you going to measure your life until it's over, right? So until you can see everything and weigh it out, and Aristotle is very much about balance and counting and weighing. Uh, so, ouch. Yeah, he is happy who lives in accordance with complete virtue and is su sufficiently equipped with external goods, not for some chance period, but throughout his complete life. So you're going to have to, if someone asks you if you're happy, you're going to have to wait a long time, I hope, to tell them. Maybe on your deathbed. Uh, the perfection of human nature. The, the practical component of living, uh, he says, is the acquisition of a moral character. I guess we don't talk about that anymore, do we? Because we kind of ruined it. Can't say moral character anymore, can you, without going, you. But yeah, it, it is moral character moral character. The theoretical com component is the making of a philosopher. Here there is no tangible reward, but the critical, I love this, the critical questioning of things raises our minds above the realm of nature and closer to the abode of the gods. The critical questioning of things, that in itself is moral character. To question, I love that. Right? And then this you may know if you took philosophy in college, the golden mean. This is how we find happiness. We steer between defects. What does he mean? The person who shuns and fears everything and stands up to nothing is a coward. All right? The person who is afraid of nothing at all but marches up to every danger is foolhardy. The golden mean, happiness lies in between. Right? So you steer between these two defects of character. And that's how you find happiness and eudaimonia. Aristotle's interesting in, in that he, he has a unique ethic. So 
again, if you took a philosophy course in college, you may know uh, deontological ethics with Kant, where you, ethics is about doing your duty regardless of the situation, or utilitarian ethics with Bentham and Mill, where it's, you know, you got to calculate the uh, greatest good for the greatest number. Aristotle didn't go either of those directions. He created something called virtue ethics, which is this, become virtuous, and then you don't have to answer, ask that question anymore. Just be virtuous. Isn't that interesting? Um, so virtue ethics is simply becoming virtuous and doing what the virtuous person does. Hmm. Um, Epicurus, uh, Stephanie, I'm putting the dates in there for you because <laughs> I know you're making this great chart of all these thinkers. This is uh, hedonism. The Greek word for pleasure, hadon. Happiness is pleasure, but we talked about Epicurus before. Um, this is not so simple as you might think. This is not a frat boy philosophy. It's just the opposite, in fact. Um, he says this, Epicurus says this, pleasure is our first and kindred good. It is the starting point of every choice and every aversion. And to it we always come back inasmuch as we make feeling the rule by which to judge every good thing. But pleasure is not the gaining of pleasure for Epicurus. It is the avoidance of pain, right? or what he calls ataraxia, the avoidance of pain, ataraxia. Right? So he says this, by pleasure we mean the absence of pain in the body, and of trouble in the soul. The absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the soul. It is not an unbroken succession of drinking bouts and revelry, Charlie. It is not sexual lust, not the enjoyment of the fish and other delicacies of a luxurious table which produce a pleasant life. It is not that. Um, it is the avoidance of pain. And he says that because revelry has a price, doesn't it? The next morning, right? The hangover. So if you truly live according to pleasure, if you truly live to avoid pain, you don't drink too much. You don't carouse. You actually live a very stoic life. Um, and... Uh, you avoid these false beliefs that produce pain, the most famous of which is, according to Epicurus, the fear of death. There's absolutely, absolutely no rational reason to fear death. Death is the cessation of experience by any definition. It's the cessation of sensation. How can you experience death? By definition, you cannot, because your senses have stopped working. So Epicurus says, why are you worrying about this? You'll never experience it. Now, of course, you can experience some things along the way, but then that's life, he says. Once again, ataraxia is, can be achieved through philosophical contemplation. I find this interesting, especially for us in 2017. Um, how this consistent bell is being rung about, I don't even want to say rationality, philosophical contemplation. You must think, you must reason to be happy. You must. Because, and it makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you don't, you're subject to the whims of your emotions, and more importantly, you're subject to the things around you over which you have no control. Right? So... It is sober reasoning, Epicurus says, searching out the grounds of every choice and avoidance, avoid pain, and banishing those beliefs through which the greatest tumults take possession of the soul. Of all this, the beginning and the greatest good is wisdom. All right? Therefore, wisdom is a more precious thing even than philosophy. I like that. Because philosophy as we know it is, you know, in the discipline is not about wisdom, but we try to, we're trying to take it back here. 
Uh, from it spring all other virtues. Wisdom, for it teaches that we cannot live pleasantly without living wisely, honorably, and justly. This is another theme that keeps reemerging here, is you must, to be happy, you must have wisdom, and you must do well to other people. Really? That's the two things. Isn't that interesting? Um, for the virtues have grown into one with a pleasant life, and a pleasant life is inseparable from these virtues. Also, it's interesting that uh, he implies that happiness is social. We had a good talk about solitude and society one night. He says, exercise yourself in these precepts day and night, both by yourself and with one who is like-minded. I know I have at times in my life thought that happiness was dependent on being alone. <laughs> Not according to Epicurus. Mencius, uh, this is roughly chronological, uh, Chinese uh, philosopher, often called the second sage. And the first sage would be Confucius, thank you, or Kung Fu Se, as he is known. The second sage, Mencius. I love this. Uh, and you can get a sense of how different Asian or Eastern wisdom is on this topic and how similar. He talks about the four sprouts. <laughs> a heart mind, and I love this, it's hyphenated, heart mind. Isn't that nice? That's typically Eastern, right? Not the separation. A heart mind that sympathizes is the sprout of co-humanity. Co-humanity. A heart mind that is aware of shame is the sprout of rightness. Remember, Asian cultures historically have been honor-shame cultures rather than righteousness-guilt cultures. So shame is a very real, functional element of their culture. A heart mind, uh, cultures. A heart mind that defers to others is the sprout of ritual propriety. Again, very similar to Confucius. A heart mind that approves and condemns is the sprout of wisdom. So you must discriminate. You must say this is, I want to do this, I don't want to do this. You can't do everything. If anyone having the four sprouts within herself knows how to develop them to the full, it is like fire catching a light or a spring as it first bursts through. If able to develop them, she is able to protect the entire world. If unable, she is unable even to serve her parents, which again is a very important quality, in, especially in Chinese cultures, is to take care of your ancestors and your parents. If she is able to develop these qualities, she is able to protect the entire world. Uh, you may know about Xi, as in Qigong. Yeah. Uh, this is breath or air, literally. The Xi, this Xi, he says, is extremely big and extremely powerful. It's going to sound a little bit like the Tao. Nourish it with righteousness and protect it from harm, and it will fill heaven and earth. It grows through the accumulation of righteousness and cannot be obtained by contrived actions. If one's actions are not satisfying to one's mind, then it shrivels up. There is also shu, uh, consideration for others. So again, the, there's that ethical element to happiness or to well-being. The myriad things are complete in us. There's no greater joy than to reflect on ourselves and to become sincere. There's no greater joy than to reflect on ourselves and become sincere. There is nothing closer to humanity than to vigorously practice shu consideration for others. A student said to Mencius, though they are equally human, why are some people great and other people small-minded? Mencius said those who follow their greater self become great people, whereas those who follow their lesser, lesser self become lesser people. Student, though they are equally human, why do some people follow their greater self and others follow their lesser self. Mencius, the senses of hearing and sight are unable to think and are thus obscured by material things. Sounds like Plato, doesn't it? When one thing acts on another, 
they can be led astray. It is the function of the mind to think. If it thinks, it will find the answer, but if it doesn't think, it won't. This is what Sean has given us. If one first establishes the greater self, then one's lesser self cannot snatch it away. This is what makes a great person. And I love this. I'm just going to read this from Mencius. The fruit of humanity is devotion to one's parents. Again, taking care of the aged. The fruit of righteousness is to respect one's elders. The fruit of wisdom is to understand these two and not to betray them. The fruit of propriety is to regulate and polish them. The fruit of music is the joy that comes from rejoicing in them. When one rejoices in them, these qualities, they grow. When they grow, how can they be stopped? I love that notion that the more you rejoice in the virtues, the happier you are, which makes you want to rejoice more. It's, it's like exponentially awesome. When they grow, how can they be stopped? And when they cannot be stopped, unconsciously, one's feet begin to dance and one's arms begin to wave. All right. Zhuang Zi, another Chinese philosopher, author of probably the first work on happiness, uh, a little essay called Supreme Happiness, which would be a great Chinese restaurant, by the way. <laughs> this, uh, you may recognize this story. I love this story. Once uh, Zhang Zhu dreamed he was a butterfly, a butterfly flitting and fluttering about, happy with himself and doing as he pleased. He didn't know that he was Zhang Zhu. Suddenly, he woke up, and there he was, solid and unmistakable, Zheng Zhu. But he didn't know if he was Zheng Zhu, who had dreamt he was a butterfly, or a butterfly dreaming he dreamt he was dreaming that he was Zheng Zhu. Between Zheng Zhu and the butterfly, there must be some distinction. This is called the transformation of things. And then there's the funeral. When Master Zhuang was about to die, his disciples wanted to give him a lavish funeral. Master Zhuang said, I take heaven and earth as my inner and outer coffins, the sun and moon as my pair of jade discs, the stars and constellations as my pearls and beads, the 10,000 things as my funerary gifts. With my burial complete, how is there anything left unprepared? What else would you do? And of course, you may know, uh, too, the principle of Wu Wei, or non-action, that appears in the Tao Te Ching and throughout Chinese philosophy. And there's a story here. Um, it's, it's also very much involved with breathing. So you can see there's this connection to India. And that's why we call it Eastern philosophy sometimes, because there's so much connection between them. But as far as Wu Wei, Butcher Ding, for example, achieves happiness by perfecting the skill of chopping up ox carcasses. This is one of the most despised professions in ancient China. And yet Ding goes about his work with great pride and pleasure, claiming that the more skillful he gets at chopping meat, the more skillful he gets at going along with things, or Wu Wei, and harmonizing with the Taoists. Uh, sages discover the, the Tao and obtain genuine happiness. Uh, Etc. Uh, so, you know, chop wood, carry water. You can find happiness there. Uh, Al Ghazali, wow, a wonderful, brilliant um, philosopher, um, uh, Muslim philosopher, uh, Persian, but uh, obviously um, Muslim, and uh, wrote a book called The Alchemy of Happiness. Um, he was Sufi, in fact. Uh, Kelly found a Manly P. Hall lecture on the alchemy of ha happiness, so uh, maybe we'll be able to get that out at some point. Happiness, again, comes from self-knowledge. Consistent, right? We have these consistent elements of happiness and well-being throughout the world and throughout history. He says this, the aim of moral discipline is to purify the heart from the rust of passion and resentment till, like a clear mirror, it reflects the light of God. And he says that, interestingly, only prophets have attained full happiness. Only prophets. Uh, because they need full knowledge. So it's not something 
that we would be able to attain unless we were a prophet. Uh, I like this, um, right, knowing the pain in the soul. The tragic condition, this is the website, the tragic condition of humanity is that our eyes have been so distracted by physical things and pleasure that we've lost the ability to see the unseen. This is why people are so unhappy. We're trying to relieve this pain in the soul by recourse to physical pleasure. But the physical, physical pleasure cannot relieve a pain that is essentially spiritual. The only answer to our condition is a pleasure that comes not from the body, but from self-knowledge. That's a statement that you can find any, in almost any religion. Now, they might treat it differently. They might blame you, <laughs> for example, for your own unhappiness. But it's still there. Um, it's about knowing yourself. Uh, again, from the website, this, this self-knowledge is not to be attained by mere thinking or philosophy. Okay, good. We needed to hear that. It's not just rationality. It's not uh, deduction. He was a Sufi, as I said, and so Al-Ghazali refers to two ways of achieving the ultimate state of happiness, and I love this. Dance and music. We've come back to this before. Remember Nietzsche and Zarathustra? Uh, that's the ultimate uh, way to, to the one to, to become enlightened. Uh, you may know the Sufis as whirling dervishes, one sect of them anyway. Um, one of the basic dances of the dervish is simply spinning around a large nail that's placed between the first two toes of his left foot. So a nail's driven into the ground between the two toes, and he just spins. Uh, this symbolizes the idea that everything revolves around God, that he's the center as well as the circumference of every activity. And as one spins, the boundaries of the self begin to fade away, and one becomes completely absorbed in true love. Euphoria is achieved when we lose consciousness, consciousness of the self and become focused on something we are completely and ultimately related to. Yes. All right. William James, brother of Henry James, uh, one of the founders of psychology, especially in America, and one of the founders of religious study. Um, says that happiness requires choice. That means it requires free will. Uh, this is from Pragmatism and other writings. By the way, he, along with Charles Sanders Peirce, created the first uniquely American philosophy, which is pragmatism. The world in itself is a neutral flux of booming, blooming confusion. Hence, it is entirely up to us whether to view it as positive, negative, or absent of all meaning. Believe that life is worth with living, and your very belief will help create the fact. Happiness requires risk-taking. Yes. Happiness is not produced by the mere thinking or resigning oneself to one's circumstances, but rather by taking bold risks and acting on possibilities that comes from the heart center or the self within. Again, we see this theme a lot, too. As if... Uh, again, this is from the website. Well, while we cannot prove rationally that free will exists or that life is meaningful, acting as if we are free or as if there is meaning in life will, through that very activity, produce a free and meaningful life. This makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, it does not make a lot of sense to me as a philosopher because, or a certain kind of philosopher because you're supposed to wait and find the facts and hear the arguments and then act. But actually, if it, it, it makes sense to me as a literature professor because it's the imagination. It's the imagination that produces happiness, not logic. And so you tell a story, and then you live the story. And we do that positively and negatively, may I say. We tell a tragedy, and we live the tragedy. Talking about me, not talking about you, but I see some nods. I think the trick, the, the skill for me is learning to tell a happy story for your life and then living that story. And sometimes just the telling of it is all you need. 
Uh, great metaphor here. We stand on a mountain pass in the midst of whirling snow and blinding mist, mist through which we get glimpses now and then of paths which may be deceptive. If we stand still, we will freeze to death. If we take the wrong road, we might be dashed to pieces. We do not certainly know whether there is any right one. What must we do? What must we do? Be strong and of good courage. Act for the best, hope for the best, and take what comes. Yes. Um, I like this too. I'm going to skip a couple of these. The slides, by the way, I always put on the website so you can go back and see these. Throughout history, the hap happiest people often record going through a deep depression caused by a sense of the loss of meaning. Yes. These events should not be repudiated, but welcomed, since only through them is the twice-born sense of renewal possible. Isn't that right? I mean, preceding contentment, bliss, happiness, well-being, isn't there all, almost always a desert experience, a bottom of the circle in the hero's journey, the apotheosis, well, ultimately your own death, figuratively? That has to happen, doesn't it? All right. Uh, I'm just going to throw up Maslow. I think you may know Maslow and the hierarchy of needs. But if you don't, you should see this um, psychologist who, um, He's the guy who said uh, my, one of my favorite sayings, to, every, to someone with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Love that. He argues that these are our needs, a hierarchy of needs. And so at the very bottom, breathing, gotcha, yep. Food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, that is not too much change, and excretion, sorry, uh, safety, Security of the body, et cetera, property, love and belonging, um, esteem, self-esteem, confidence, achievement, and then self-actualization. So uh, that, that makes sense. Um, it's a little too neat for me, but I don't know that he meant it to be all-encompassing. Uh, but yeah, so there's Maslow. I did not know about this person uh, until... I went through the website, Marie Jahoda. She's the founder of Positive Psychology. Did anybody know this? I didn't know it. Yeah. She said um, she formulated the basis of what's called to be positive psychology in a book called Current Concepts in Mental Health, uh, Mental Health, sorry. And she criticized psychologists for focusing completely on mental disease and not paying enough attention to well being. Yes, she argued um, that the concept of mental disease itself was scientifically problematic. And she was right, because you know the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, is not, it's not a math equation. It's an interpretation. So if, if in 1950 you were to look at that book, you would see that homosexuality is a mental disease. And who knows what we're going to see that's in there now, 50 years from now, right? Um, <clears throat> she says, given what was considered to be mentally ill depends largely on social conventions rather than the something inherent in the human mind. Far more encouraging, she believed, was the concept of mental health. Something uh, functioning in the mind in the appropriate social context. So it's not something absolute or reified, but it's related to your context. Uh, and she identified these five characteristics of mentally well people, healthy people. Sounds pretty basic, but we always forget them. I always forget them. Manage your time well, have meaningful social relationships. And she says specifically, not on Facebook. I don't know if she said that. Uh, work effectively in groups. Ooh, that's a hard one, right? High self-esteem. OK, where do we get that? <laughs> uh, regularly active. Pretty basic, but ones that we don't often, or I don't often follow through on. 
<laughs> oh, the name? Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, you want to try it? No? That's fairly close, but really not. Um, <laughs> Mihai Chixin Mihai. Mihai. So that's the first, Mihai Chixin Mihai. You see the last, the first name is there at the end too. Mihai Chixin Mihai. Uh, Czech, I think. <laughs> Mihai Chixin Mihai. I've referenced this guy a couple of times just in passing. I don't know if you picked up on it, but he wrote a book called Flow. This is a very important book. And he says flow is, well, you know it. You know flow. Um, it's not flow, Florence. Flow, F-L-O-W. You know flow as that, well, let me just describe it. A state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience is so enjoyable that people will continue to do it, even at great cost, for the sheer sake of doing it, right? So this is not your phone. Again, that is not flow, um, even though you may do it at great cost. <laughs> you know what he's talking about there. Uh, I've mentioned it a few times in terms of religion. It's... Um, it's when you're playing music and you're playing beyond you, anything you've ever played and you don't know why and you're almost watching yourself do it and you're like, you're in flow. It's probably Steph Curry most of the time on the basketball court who you're just, you're not thinking. You're not, you're just, it's just like, that's why it's called flow. It's like something's flowing through you, right? And you've stepped out of the way. And in religious studies, we call that experience ecstasy, which is literally in Greek to stand outside, right? So you've, stand, so you've stood aside and something is flowing through you. Nick, you've experienced this playing music, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, you have. And a sure way to not experience it is to think too much about it, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, he says... Um, the best moments usually occur when a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. Those things, are, those things are all important. Let me say it again. The best moments occur when a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits voluntarily, right? Because that doesn't work if someone's stretching you. Uh, in an effort to accomplish something both difficult and worthwhile, right? Yeah, Charlie. It shouldn't. If you have expectations, you're thinking too much. So let, let me read some of these, these uh, elements here. There are clear goals every step of the way. Okay, so you're not flying blind. You, you know that you need to hit these chords in this order and this arpeggio here. Um, there's an immediate feedback to one's actions. Isn't that interesting? That's why sports and music are more typical of flow than anything else. There's an immediate feedback right, with an audience. or It doesn't even have to be an audience. It can just be the sounds you're producing uh, or the plays you're making. Interesting, there's a balance between challenges and skills. right? So if you're, if you're doing something that, that you're an expert at, that you've done so many times that it's not even hard for you, you won't experience flow. If you try to do something too hard that you're, you haven't built up to, you will not experience flow. Action and awareness are merged. Action and awareness are merged. That means, to me, that means you can't be thinking. Like, I'm always... Like, yeah, I'll be honest with you. When I'm up here talking, I have a whole other conversation going on in my head. I do. So I'm not in flow most of the time. Maybe you noticed. It's when, you know this, right? It's when there's just that awareness and the body and the mind are complete. There's no separation. Action and awareness are merged. Distractions are excluded from consciousness. Excluded from consciousness. So you can be in an arena like Nick fills these arenas when he plays his guitar, but it's just Nick and his guitar, right? 
or it's a basketball player in this big arena of 30,000 people, but it doesn't matter because it's just you. It's just the player and the game. Right? I remember when I was playing sports, I was a mess. I was not good, but one thing I could do was just try to focus in on something close. And I do this in public speaking, too. When I used to get nervous, I would like focus in on something close because it reduced the distractions, right? It reduced your awareness. There's no worry of failure. Well, there it is, right? There it is. There's no worry of failure. Doesn't mean you won't fail. It means there's no worry of failure. You will not be in flow if you're scared. No way. Self-consciousness disappears. That's why expectations are gone, Charlie. Sense of time is distorted. I love this, right? Sense of time is distorted. Uh, so you're playing your music, and you're like, what was that, 15 minutes? And somebody says, no, you did an hour and a half show. right? Or stand-up comedy, Pam. <laughs> Does this, do you have flow in stand-up comedy? <laughs> oh, you don't? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I, I love that feeling because time is artificial. It's a construct. It's our construct. I know it seems solid and, and uh, mechanical, but it's not. It, it changes in our experience. If you've ever had a wreck, car wreck, things slow down, right? And you go, oh, this is going to happen. And you watch it happen slowly, right? That's time. Time, <laughs> time is variable. Um, and then the activity becomes an end in itself. What is that? That's Aristotle and Entelechy, right? The action becomes an end in itself. You're not doing it to impress somebody in the stands or the owner or what anybody. It's the end. In, you're not even do it, doing it to impress yourself. You're just doing the action. Of course, Manly P. Hall had a lot to say about happiness. Here's what I like best. Um, Thus we learn, oh right, the happiest people in th this world and not, are not the ones, sorry, who have demanded happiness for themselves. Uh-oh, there goes the whole happiness industry. Because <laughs> you're supposed to demand your happiness. He says, no, it's not those who have demanded happiness for themselves, but rather those who have sought wisely and lovingly to increase the happiness of others. It's very strange, isn't it? That's how it works. And then he goes on to say, thus we learn that a principle of happiness is adjustment. When we're able to adapt ourselves easily and simply to the changes which time must bring, there are fewer resentments and less self-pity. When we cling to the past, we invite a nostalgic mood which can become habit-forming and is always detrimental. If we believe that it is a spiritual and moral duty to contribute to the improvement of family and friends, it is just as true that we should contribute to our own self-improvement. Men and women are immortal beings who must face their own futures and must build today the character that will serve them tomorrow. To become better persons ourselves serves the identical end in terms of social progress that is attained by the improvements which may bring to another. Look at, listen to that last line again. To become better persons ourselves serves the identical end in terms of social progress that is attained by the improvements which may bring to another. I don't know if, well, I do know that you feel this way. You see what's happening in our country and in the world, and you think, what do I do? How, what can I possibly do? Manly Hall says, become happy. Improve yourself. And you improve yourself, you become happy by helping other people. And that's not just some romantic notion. It's the result of Manly Hall's studies. Do you know Derek Walcott's poem, Love After Love? You're about to. Let me end with this. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome. And say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, 
give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>